All right, everybody, um, here's your quick bedtime story. We're moving into the high Middle Ages, and we've just gone through that stone soup period of the Middle Ages, where the only thing that survived the collapse of Rome was the church. And the church kind of fills the power vacuum while Western Europe was a mess. And Charlemagne brings brief political unity back and then with the Treaty of Verdun, it's shattered again. And feudalism takes over, and we stay in these tiny, small communities, self-sufficient, so bad guys don't know where we are. And this brings us to the High Middle Ages from about 1000 to 1300, uh, right before the Renaissance. And a couple things are going to happen. Number one, Europe is going to emerge from the Dark Ages, and new cities and towns are going to be created. We're going to break out of this old castle mentality and a new order is going to come about in Europe. And not only are new cities and towns, you know, before we had the church in the middle um, and the castle, well, we're now going to build a whole town like Rotenberg, the one I showed you guys on the video. And as a result, Separate monarchies are going to begin to grow. We're going to get modern nation states are going to begin to take root in England and in Spain. We're going to get the birth of modern countries. Germany, the old Holy Roman Empire, will remain in disarray and chaos. The saying will be, there is a prince or a king in Germany for every day of the year. The early part of the High Middle Ages and what we're going to focus on here right now is a conflict that will grow between popes and emperors. In the Middle Ages, the pope was the unquestioned leader. There was nobody politically powerful enough to rival him. Pope Leo crowns Charlemagne. Well, the problem with that is now in these separate countries, we're going to get a king in France, a king in England. We're going to get an emperor in Germany, the Holy Roman Emperor, and they are going to vie for dominance. Who is stronger, a pope or an emperor? And the whole thing gets started with a process known as lay investiture. And it starts with this guy here, Gregory VII. Gregory, um, if you're a fan of the Gregorian chant, kind of the way we sing happy birthday here in uh, first and, and third period, um, you know, that kind of loud, boring, monotone. Well, that's Pope Gregory. And he is a strong, powerful guy. And what he wants to do is end the process of what's called lay investiture. Investing in a lay person. And a lay person is someone who does not work for the church, someone who is not ordained. You are not a priest, you are not a bishop, you are just a guy. So if I went to my church and gave a sermon, I'm a lay person. I can get up there and talk, but I have no religious, you know, I've never been to the seminary, I've got no religious training. And so lay investiture is this simple yet complicated thing that forces a confrontation between popes and these new emperors and like, you know, Spain, uh, or Spain, France, England, Germany. And it concerned over who has the most authority, the church, which has been around since the fall of Rome, or the state. And what lay investiture is, was the creation or designation of church offices making someone an archbishop, making someone a bishop, making someone um, a priest. The only person who could do that was the pope or another high-ranking church officials. Bishops, abbots who were heads of monasteries, have to be given those titles by the church. But in the high Middle Ages, regional kings and emperors begin to do that. They create church title and church officials from their buddies, figuring the people listen to the church. So if my buddies, my lords, are now bishops and, and abbots and monks, 
They control the minds and the hearts of the people. Everybody's going to listen to them. It will aid my ability to rule. Problem is, if I make Mr. Rober a bishop, well, Mr. Rober's never been to the seminary. How can I, as a king, make my buddy a high-ranking church office? It was a no-no. And so many popes during the high Middle Ages wanted to end this practice. Gregory is the first one that's going to step up and do something about it. Many said, they only said it, church officials are the only authority possible to create bishops and abbots. If a lay person does this, it will deviate the church from its mission. Its job is salvation to save souls, not to be a political tool to be used. People will be greedy. They will forget about working for the church and the people, and they'll look after themselves. But when modern nation states, France, England, parts of Germany, it's much, much, much easier to gain this political, clout, gain this political authority if you work for the church. So Gregory VII will lead the charge in the first big confrontation in the Pope versus Emperor's conflict starts early on. And he will take on the Holy Roman Emperor, a guy named Henry IV. And Henry IV is going to be the first big time emperor that we've seen in a long time. And backing up Gregory is going to be a small monastery in south central France known as Cluny or Clunay. Since the Treaty of Verdun in 843, there had been no single dominant emperor in Europe. This is going to change in the mid 900s, around 950, when a small ruler, the Holy Roman Emperor, a guy named Otto the Great, inherits a strong position from his father. Otto's dad was a skullcracker, kind of like Charlemagne. And when Otto the Great became king, he did not treat his feudal lords, his dukes, and his counts as rulers of their own tiny little independent kingdoms, but instead he treated them as subordinates in a hierarchical chain of command. I'm the general, you're the colonel, you're the major, you're the captain, you're the lieutenant. Don't tell me the king of your own tiny little empire, because I put you there. You are my vassal, you are my subordinate. And as part of his reorganization, Otto liked to use the church. Why appoint a noble who's going to become greedy and corrupt, and his family may resent mine, when instead I can use the local bishop or the local abbot. They're already there, the people know them, and they can't have a rival family or dynasty to come after me. And so Otto uses them for those two reasons. People listen to them, and they will not have a son who will come and attack me. So, in turn... These church officials like the idea of one single Holy Roman Emperor, singular, much like Charlemagne. We don't like having a bunch of these guys. We want to talk to one, one guy that gets the job done. And so, as he does this, um, Otto the Great liked to have clergy members, religious men, in his government. They wouldn't create this competitive dynasty that would dethrone him. And so Otto says, I'm going to make my governmental administrators, um, my royal administrators, members of the church. This is going to be easy. And in 961, Otto will be crowned the emperor. And when he does so, he quickly tries to assume control of the church inside the entire Holy Roman Empire. This kicks off a a confrontation between him and Pope Gregory. At this exact same, exact same time, here in Clunay, there was the monastery who was tired of the argument who had more power, the emperor or the pope. And so in Clunay, they believed the church was an open organization 
where anybody, theoretically, any believer can achieve salvation. And any believer could theoretically become the Pope. Right? So me growing up Catholic, I could become the Pope. Would not be a real good idea, but it could happen. And the monks at Clunay were strict followers of the Benedictine order, that rule book. This is what you do, how you do it, when you do it, time to eat, time to work, time to pray, time to sleep. And they were determined to maintain a church that was spiritually focused, its original mission. And they resented and rejected the idea that any member of the church from the lowly poorish parish trees, priest excuse me, up to the Pope was subservient to the emperor. And they supported the Pope in saying he is the sole authority when it comes to defining the church. And as Henry and Gregory begin to argue about this, Pope Gregory will excommunicate Henry IV, it means he kicks him out of the church to demonstrate his power and the power of the church. And that, I'm going to make a note here, is where we are going to pick up tomorrow. Have a good night, guys. Thanks for watching.